Don Hollister uh, lived with Arthur Morgan as cook and companion when Arthur was 93 and Don was 19. Don then joined the community service, now Agraria staff, and over the intervening 50 years has worked four different stints there. In 1972, he was part of the collective that founded Communities Journal and then Communities Magazine. And then he has also been a lifelong resident of Yellow Springs. He has a passion for local civics, devoting much of his time to projects and policies that he believes help maintain social fellowship in his hometown. Thanks for being here, Don. Uh, good morning. Uh, Rose, could you go to the next slide? And th this is my theme uh, for the next few minutes. Um, Arthur Morgan described community as both a fundamental of human society and as a medium of cultural change. And uh, should we go to the next slide? Uh, you know, what is community? And we all have different social experiences. We have different lives. Uh, but this is a quote from Morgan. As a pile of lumber, nails, part of the cover that up. As a pile of lumber, nails, and paint is not a house, so just a collection of people is not a community. And our, our lives play out differently. We have to make some degree of assumption that everyone is you know, seeing the same things we're seeing, but in reality, it's not. Uh, and that's something that I don't know that all his life, Morgan was thinking about this, but certainly later in life, uh, he used a lot about how people's experiences, uh, you know, their fundamental framework uh, in their social framework affects what they see and how they interact with others. And if we go to the next slide. If you step back, thinking again just about that pile of lumber versus how does it become a house? I grew up in Yellow Springs, and a lot of my friends were from military families, and they moved every three years uh, for much of their life. Uh, and then I have other friends who were pretty much in, in place for their whole childhood and full adult life. And I asked one of my friends, how many people do you know, how many of your peers have you met or had some familiarity with their grandparents and their parents? And now you know their children and you've met their grandchildren. You might someday meet the great grandchildren. How many, how many people, how many friends do you have like that? And this guy said, oh, maybe two dozen. And I was kind of floored because I was stretching towards one dozen. Uh, but that gives a framework, a, a time perspective that is different than simply being at the coffee shop and having some really good friends. And if you also go, oh, you know, he looks just like his grandfather. Or, He's a jerk, just like his dad. Or I'm impressed that the son is so different than the father. Anyway, that, um, That examination of how our experiences affect our behavior, Morgan really drilled in. I mean, the Fells Institute, a longitudinal study of human, humans from birth or even prenatal through death, 
Uh, that was pretty amazing. And part of what he was getting at is, okay, we have a civilization that looks fragile from his point of view. And this is before we have the life we have now with much more global economy. If everything fell apart, what would survive? And that he goes back to the foundation of uh, both individually our memories, but then also the patterns of behavior that get passed on, particularly in, from those early years, growing up at home, in the neighborhood, interacting with other families. They might not be neighbors, but through church. Or, uh, and how do you work in that world of local, intimate, uh, let's, let's say intimate neighbor relations, uh, and if you want to make a change, quite apart from saving our civilization, if you just want to encourage certain changes in social assumptions, uh, certain social practices, that's going to have more durability and um, more, well, more endurance if it's a pattern that families develop, that kids imitate from their earliest, even pre-memory years. Uh, and, and this is what he's getting at in this quote, people differ from other animals and that we live more by what we learn than by instinct. Civilization resides not in our blood, but in our society. Uh, well, is this ignoring, could I go to the next slide? Uh, is this ignoring all the experiences of my friends who move every three years in their childhood? No, but how will they pass on uh, their habits, the, the, the values that they uh, hold true? Well, certainly in how they live their own lives with their friends and in, in raising children and maybe trying to have a neighborhood interaction. But the, I would say, more durable uh, setting where something would get passed on, let's say over a in the next few hundred years would be in what we now would think of as kind of backwater places. Um, not so, not as likely an urban neighborhood, but some rural crossroads, uh, some Appalachian uh, back valley <clears throat> where the intimate family and community persists uh, through time, not just for one generation. Now, there are lots of examples in Morgan's life. Some of them were referred to yesterday uh, where he tried to build uh, community. The, the worker towns with people building dams, most of them got dismantled after Dam was built, although there are some neighborhoods around Dayton that have survived. Silo uh, community, in my understanding, his initial dream was not what we now would call an intentional community, but it, it was very close. Uh, and I'm looking forward to hearing what Laird says about intentional community a little later in this conversation. Uh, but if both, if we want to change our 
learned behaviors about racism, about uh, gender and inter intimate relationships, about how you approach work, uh, you name it. It starts with how we live with our children, with our neighbor's children, and then how we treat our friends, how we treat our neighbors. Um, and Morgan, he, he used all sorts of phrases, seedbed of society. Uh, it, it sounds too simple, but you know, in our world of the internet, and uh, being able to drive two hours to see my grandkids. You know, all that could go away with one solar pulse zapping the grid. Uh, we see little hints off and on when we have you know, an economic recession or even collapses. But what would, the worst case, if there were still humans alive, what would be the basis for passing on patterns of behavior and the values that we think are good? And people may disagree what those are, and you could, you could have an intentional community, for instance, that espouse values that I don't share, that it could successfully uh, create a different civilization that I wouldn't uh, endorse. But that's the building block, small local community. Can we get the next slide, please. Uh, the book, uh, The Future of Community and Community of the Future, is an expansion of this quote from Morgan. The new community can be something new under the sun. It can recover the precious qualities of the old, the fellow feeling, acquaintance, goodwill, mutual respect, the planning and working together for common ends. It can escape the narrowness and provincialism of the old village. It must have clearing houses for exchange of ideas and experience. Now, this does not dismiss all the other kinds of things that Morgan worked on or inspired. But as he got older, he seemed to focus more and more on this kind of mountaintop view. What's going on? Is our civilization going to survive? Uh, how do we pass on the best? Uh, and how do we make something new? And that it, his answer was through community. Thanks, that's all I have. Don, I think you were going to in, uh, introduce our other um, panelists. Okay, well, I don't have our bios in front of us, in front of me, but Emily Seibel, Marianne McQueen, and Laird Schwab. I, uh, I talk with Emily once a week. She's director of Yellow Springs Home Inc. and involved in other things in the community. Uh, and Yellow Springs Home Inc. And one of their fundamentals is they're a, a community land trust. And then I'll introduce Marianne later. Emily, do you want to speak? Yes, thank you. Hello, good morning, everybody. Um, I am going to share my screen. Just give me a second. 
Okay, can you see the main slide? Just give me a thumbs up, Don. Okay, <laughs> great. So um, I am Emily Seibel and I'm a 2006 graduate from Antioch College. Um, I currently serve as the executive director of Yellow Springs Home Inc. And um, I'm a brand new member of the Antioch College Board of Trustees as well. I'm very happy to be here today. Um, so this photo showcases our mission in action. You can see Antioch students volunteering to help paint a community land trust home. And as we will see, the community land trust in Yellow Springs uh, in many ways is an extension of Morgan's vision, including economic and cultural vitality of the small community, building community resilience and economic self-reliance while serving human needs. And um, so today I'm very happy to be presenting. I think this is the first time in over a decade that I've been on a panel with Don Hollister, who is uh, one of the uh, people who founded Yellow Springs Home Inc. And he signed these articles of incorporation, which I put a screenshot up of. And Marianne McQueen, um, who was our founding director uh, both created Yellow Springs Homing to further some of Arthur E. Morgan's vision and legacy. Um, so over 20 years ago, Don and a couple other people filed this paperwork. The cost to file at that time was $25. I have the receipt in our files. Um, and you can see that our, our purpose for existence is really furthering Morgan's commitment to local and cooperative living, to further st strong democratic values, economic resilience, networks of mutual aid and support, mental and physical well-being, and ethical behavior. So I think it's really about looking at the human ecosystem and how we interact with the land and how we interact with one another. Here is our mission. We believe that housing is a fundamental right um, and community land trusts are really designed to remove land from the speculative market to benefit the community forever. It's a very, very powerful concept. And it's a little bit different though related to conservation land trusts, which is I think what most folks think about when they think land trust. Um, in which uh, an organization, a conservation land trust just holds the development rights forever. Um, this is a, a different approach though related to, um, you know, making sure that the community has control over its future through the land. Um, and so the heart of the community land trust today is to create permanently affordable home ownership opportunities that benefit generations of uh, lower income families, but CLTs also develop urban and rural agriculture. They uh, also sometimes have a land trust, conservation land trust component. They develop commercial spaces and they do affordable rental and for sale housing. Basically anything you can do on land to benefit the community, uh, including the preservation of that land is, is the, in the interest of a community land trust. And so Arthur Morgan, played a central role in the historical development of the community land trust. And so I wanted to take us through a very brief, uh, incomplete history of the community land trust movement origins, which you'll see are very closely aligned with the work of Arthur Morgan. Um, it, and so all of the things I'm about to show you ask really fundamental questions about the collective, about land ownership, about the nature of economic inequality and present alternatives. Um, so the roots stretch from early land pi reform pioneers to the rural cooperative um, agricultural settlements in Israel, the Gramdan village gift uh, land program in India and the Southern civil rights movement. And so uh, here are just a few highlights. Um, as early as the 1700s, we're going all the way back here. Um, Thomas Paine argued that only structural improvements should be entreated as individual property, not the land itself. In the 1800s, John Stuart Mill asserted that most appreciation in the value of land is an unearned increment 
caused by the development of society, not by the investment of individual landowners. Henry George developed the idea of a single tax or land value tax, which is the idea that poverty exists largely because of unearned appreciation on land. In his view, a single tax could create more social equity. So during this time in the 1800s, two single tax colonies were established uh, that remain today in Arden, Delaware and Fairhope, Alabama. There were also uh, in the early 1900s, some, some early uh, community land trust pioneers, if you will, before the land trust actually exists as we know it today. Um, and some really interesting publications at this time. Uh, R.H. Taney published The Acquisitive Society, drawing a practical and moral distinction between passive property and active property. There was also a publication of absentee ownership and business enterprise in recent times, The Case of America, in which Thorstein Veblen declares that land speculation and not baseball is the great American game. And also the publication of this ugly civilization by Ralph Borsodi decried land speculation and suggested that land should be treated as a trust. And that is where Arthur Morgan enters the conversation. As you know, before becoming the president of Antioch College, Arthur Morgan served as one of three chairmen of the Tennessee Valley Authority as part of the New Deal. And in this position, he planned the creation of a leased land community in Norris, Tennessee that experimented in community land holding. He established Norris, Tennessee as a planned community to house workers building the Tennessee Valley Authority's first dam. Mark Morgan had uh, high expectations to make Norris different by planning a community for the workers, not just temporary housing. Uh, he and his staff laid out a model town, including uh, small all-electric homes set on winding streets, dormitories, a cafeteria, and even a community building. And Morgan brought in J.D. Dawson from Antioch College to direct a social and educational program at that time. Workers on each shift were offered four-hour courses in farming, dairying, stock breeding, and chicken raising at the demonstration farm and classes in iron working, furniture making, and draftsmanship in the village. And then in 1938, Morgan made a second attempt to establish a planned community on leased land. Using money from a Chicago philanthropist, he purchased 1,200 acres north of Asheville, North Carolina, and developed a land leased settlement called the Silo Community. The Community Land Trust promotes permanent affordability and was initiated in part by Morgan's writings in these community land experiments. He had a vision of an ideal community, a utopian dream influenced by the writings of Edward Bellamy and by Morgan's familiarity with uh, the garden cities of England and the single tax colony in Fairhope, Alabama, where his oldest son had attended the School of Organic Education. For this reason, Arthur Morgan was inducted recently into the Community Land Trust Hall of Fame. And the criteria are, show, are shown here. It's a small group of people. It's, it's really cool that there's this uh, very strong, clear connection between Arthur Morgan and the Community Land Trust movement today that's celebrated internationally, this legacy. And uh, students are learning about his contributions all over the world as this movement blossoms. Um, and so Morgan's writings influenced another early community land trust pioneer who also had ties to Yellow Springs, um, which I'll talk about in a moment. But uh, in Yellow Springs, Arthur Morgan founded Community Service, Inc. in 1940, as you know. And after his experiences at the Tennessee Valley Authority, Morgan looked to spread his ideas of decentralized economic development by supporting and working towards his ideas of the small community. And um, of course, today we have Community Solutions. And as part of the original Charter of Community Service, Inc., uh, was alternative ways of living as exemplified in the intentional community, which was very loosely defined at that time as people living in small groups, sharing land, and often working together in business. 
In his study of leased land communities, uh, Bob Swan, uh, who it moved to Yellow Springs in 1946 to work at Community Solutions. Um, he believed that land could be, that they could be made much stronger, um, the, it, the idea of the intentional community by really involving the community itself in the governance and leadership of the, of the community. Um, Bob Swan was soon drawn away to work for social justice and the Southern Civil Rights Movement. He began working with Slater King, cousin to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. on a solution. Slater King was a prominent leader of the Albany movement and demanded an end to all segregation. With a background studying economics, he witnessed African-American families being kicked out of their homes and losing their land just for registering to vote or speaking out against segregation. Uh, the two, Dr. Uh, I'm sorry, Slater King and Bob Swan, met after the uh, Committee for Nonviolent Action was formed. An earlier connection between Swan and King families uh, occurred when the Swans were still living in Yellow Springs and Bob was working for Arthur Morgan. Uh, Bob's wife, Marjorie Swan, met Coretta Scott, a student at Antioch at the time through CORE, which is the Congress of Racial Equality, and the two became very good friends. Uh, and shown here is Coretta receiving her undergraduate degree with her husband, Martin, and the president emeritus of Antioch College, Arthur E. Morgan. Slater King and Bob Swan met at a discussion put together by Clarence Jordan at the uh, integrated Koinonia Farm. And that resulted in a new self-help housing project for low-income families called Koinonia Partners that became the forerunners for the world's largest nonprofit housing agency, the Habitat for Humanity. Uh, they became friends and developed a quick bond of trust based on their shared mutual beliefs. And during the same period was when Martin Luther King Jr. founded the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. During their work together, Swan and King came to focus on land reform, land access and economic self-sufficiency for African-Americans as key to civil rights and social justice. Owning land and protecting land tenure with community governance was critical. They witnessed black farmers forced off their land in retaliation for voting. And together they came to realize that part of the oppression and insecurity of African-Americans was due to limited access and control over land. So they grappled with the same question. How does a protest movement become a constructive movement? What happens after the legislation passes to create lasting economic empowerment? Slater King, Charles Sherrod, uh, Bob Swan and others traveled to Israel then, a trip funded by the Norman Foundation and the National Sharecroppers Fund. On their return, they convened a meeting in Atlanta of representatives from a dozen different civil rights organizations, encouraging the creation uh, in the American South of something like the Moshav model they had encountered in Israel. Moshavim were planned settlements that combined individually owned homes on community owned land with agricultural production and marketing organized on a cooperative basis. At that time, uh, then New Communities Inc. was incorporated in the following year. So this was 1969, or 1970, excuse me. And 1970 was also the year that Arthur E. Morgan uh, retired from serving as the executive director of Community Solutions. So there is so much to say about the world's first community land trust, New Communities Inc. Uh, I don't have time, unfortunately, during uh, today's presentation, but the full story is documented in the film Arc of Justice, The Rise and Fall of a Beloved Community, and involves discrimination, drought, loan refusals, land loss, and the largest class action lawsuit in the history of the United States. When New Communities Inc. was formed, it was the largest tract of African-American owned land in the country at the time at over 9,000 acres. Um, and today, the long movement continues 
addressing contemporary controversies such as African-American land loss, food-related disparities, environmental and economic justice, and other related efforts like social justice and racial healing. Um, and so I just wanna thank you for your time today. Um, you know, as moving forward, as we think about regenerative, resilient, intergenerational approaches to land economy and community, uh, the Community Land Trust has a place in the conversation. And we look forward uh, at Yellow Springs Home Inc of continuing the discussion uh, with community solutions about potential collaborations, looking at these different areas of overlap. And we uh, truly support you in your work and are very grateful to um, you know, be in the, located in the same community as you and Susan. I just, what you're doing is absolutely phenomenal. I think we are right at 15 minutes, so I'm gonna stop talking. Emily, thanks so much. That was really awesome. Look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Emily. Now? I'm uh, having trouble not sharing my screen. Hang on. You're having trouble not sharing your screen? Or sharing, there we go. <laughs> well, you did good sharing. Uh, also with us is Laird Schwab. Hi, Laird. Uh, Laird lived four decades at Sand Hill Farm, an income sharing rural community in Northeast Missouri that he helped found in 1974. He also served as the main administrator of the Foundation for Intentional Community for 28 years, 1987 to 2015, and sat on the Community Solutions Board for two terms, 2014 to 15. Since 1987, he has been a consultant on cooperative group dynamics and a facilitation trainer working with more than 100 communities across America, across North America. In recent years, his focus on the social side of sustainability has expanded to include an active interest in sustainable economics. Today, he lives in Duluth, Minnesota, where he continues his teaching, consulting, writing. His blog is Community and Consensus, blogspot.com. Laird, uh, it's good to see you. Okay, thank you, Dan. There's a lot of familiar faces here on the screens, and I know there's a lot of people that are uh, listening who are, don't have their videos on, but we'll do our best here. Um, I want to, rather than give a skein of a lot of history stuff, which is probably interesting, I want to focus on, I guess, I've, my life didn't, I'm 71 years old, but my life didn't overlap with Arthur Morgan's. That is, I never met him, although I have a great deal of familiarity with the Morgan family. I, I met both of uh, Arthur's sons, Ernest and Griscom, and <clears throat> knew Jane Morgan, and both of uh, their, their kids, Faith and John, and Faith's the same age as I am, and so I have some touching of the Morgan family. Um, the, the seeds that I want to focus on here is the way in which <clears throat> Arthur established this organization, first as community service and, and now what it is today, and, and as, as a vehicle for connection of, I guess, of, of, of communities, the, notably from where I sit, they, as it was been pointed out by Emily and others, the community service group helped start a group that was called the Fellowship of Intentional Communities in 1949. And it was at that time a, a relative, basically a group of people that got um, April, if you could turn your, your uh, sound off, we wouldn't hear you sneeze. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, so if, um, where was I? I was gonna say in 49, this group was Ohio Valley and Mid-Atlantic communities that was largely motivated by people who did conscientious objection during World War II. Many of them had served jail time. And they wanted to get together and talk both shop about, about living in community, but also how could, how could we, uh, what did we learn from World War II that we wouldn't have to repeat it? 
you know, that's a big target and there's arguments about like how far do they get with that conversation. But notably, it was a meeting, it was a gathering, an annual gathering of people uh, that lived in intentional community to talk about what that experience was like and what might be done with it. I don't know that they had very ambitious plans, that original group, but they met regularly together and it was husbanded and helped supported by community solutions during those, or community service it was called at that time, uh, during those years. That became dormant after a while, but, but uh, the seed was sort of, although it went dormant, it became alive and, uh, or that is it became husbanded by that group. And in, in, in the mid 1980s, Charles Betterton, who lived at a community called Stell in North Central Illinois <clears throat> was, uh, was inspired to sort of restart FIC. And, and so he got a grant from community service to of $2,000, I think at the time, to help pull together people, a new generation of people and restart the, the fellowship and see where that led. And I was part of that. So, I, and so in some ways I benefited from that connection from the Morgans. And, and, and then FIC became a, an ongoing thing. And so it became a national clearinghouse of information about intentional communities. And I'm gonna draw the connection between small community and intentional community. in that I think that there's a great deal of resonance philosophically between what intentional communities are trying to be models of a, of a, of a healthy society moving forward in contrast to what we see mainly in mainstream culture. And I think it's in the spirit that Arthur meant in terms of what would be a vibrant resilient small communities. Now, he was thinking, I think, villages and small towns more than an intentional community, but I don't really know that for sure. Intentional community is even a smaller bite in the sense that it's usually groups of anywhere from 10, 60. There's, there's some variety, some are smaller, some are bigger, but they're smaller units than, the, than a small village or town. Uh, so, and yet we still have the same challenge. I think fundamentally, the, when you talk about having a town that's working together, a small community or intentional community being vibrant and healthy, it means the, the fundamental challenge of cooperative living is how do you disagree about things when the stakes are high and have that be an experience that brings you together rather than drains you and is divisive. And as that's the, that's the field I work in. And a lot of intentional communities struggle to have that kind of experience. And so in other words, we're trying to learn the nuts and bolts on a group dynamics level of how does cooperative culture actually function? How do you make that work? It's great to have the theory. It's great to write about it, but how do you do it on the ground? How do you create a community that has that quality, has that kind of conversation where there's inclusivity and the recognition that people are gonna disagree? How do we work through that and do it well? Because the mainstream culture mostly doesn't give us a good model for that. And so how do we, how do we learn from it? That's to me the biggest, most important impact of intentional communities. Not, not because I think a lot of people will ever live that way, because it's a very tiny percent. It's like three hundredths of 1% of the US population live in intentional community. While that number is growing, it's very, very tiny. So it's not the wave of the future, but it's the R&D centers for how culture can work. And so we're trying to learn, what do we mean cooperative culture? What are we learning about? How do we get along? How do we be real with each other and get us closer together? So the idea isn't homogenization, but, but listening to differences and living with breathing in and out through diversity. That's the challenge. Whether that's what Arthur meant or not, I don't know, but that's what's become of the seed that he helped plant and the part that, that I touch and what I think is vital. I think a lot of us, you know, all of us have ideas we put out there and we don't always know which ones are gonna, are, are gonna sprout nor what fruit they will produce, whether, you know, so I don't, I can't, I'm not in a position to speak what Arthur meant, but I can say this is what's come of that seed and why I think it's important. Now, in addition to the challenge that I named there about how do you disagree and how do you function well, because, because, and, and this is crucial, because it's about social sustainability. It's like, how do we work together without trying to have one subs be subsumed under another, but we listen to all voices and figure out how to move together. In addition to that challenge, I think it's worth noting, and I'm touching back, I think, on something that was, I believe, highlighted yesterday, which was the economic side of Arthur Morgan's work, but that also touches intentional community. There's two important ways in which communities are, are, are trying to be models of something moving forward in terms of sustainability, and it ties back into the concept of resilience. One of them is the power of sharing. 
we have somehow gotten is a mainstream culture very far down the line of um, you need ownership of things to have high quality of life when really you don't. What you need, I think, is access to things, not ownership. And so there's power in sharing things. And so communities are great at, we don't have to own one of everything. We can collectively own some things. You know, it probably makes sense to, you know, have maybe have your own household kitchen and stuff, and maybe you need your own vacuum cleaner, but I don't know that you need your own lawnmower, or you certainly don't, everybody doesn't need to own a pickup truck or a table saw. And, so, and there's so many different things that you want access to, but you don't need to own if you can work out the dynamics of sharing. And communities are powerful in that. And think about how that becomes an economic lever in the sense of if you don't have to own a thing, but can share it and have access to it, you don't need as many dollars to create a quality of life. And so that gives you a lot of economic freedom in terms of doing work you love because it doesn't have to have a high salary because you don't have to own everything. So communities are pioneering, what does it mean to share? Not because you got to, but because you can and it makes sense instead of chasing acquisition of goods. All right, so that's one lever. The other one is how we define security. We have gotten into a place in the mainstream culture where it's mostly defined in terms of bank accounts, insurance policies, do you have enough money stored aside to protect yourself as you age and become infirm and aren't able to do as many things as you, as you once were to survive until death and maybe still have something left over to pass on to your heirs? However, historically, that's not where security was defined. If you think in terms of tribes and villages or small communities, then I think traditionally security is in terms of relationships. The village takes care of its own. It holds each other. And if you trust in your relationships, if that is your security, because everybody doesn't get sick at the same time or everybody doesn't break down at the same time and you have a, an intergenerational mix, you can always, the village can take care of it's the people who need support and then they will be supported in turn. And if, and if that is your security, again, you don't need dollars to do it. What you need is healthy relationships. What you need is connection and solidity and a sense of the, the village or the, or, the, or the town takes care of its own. And this, is a, this, is, this, I think, is in the spirit of what I think Arthur meant by small community. And again, that becomes an enormous lever of like, wow, if I have strong relationships, I don't have to chase dollars to have a good life. I have to invest in people and in connection and in getting along. So those are things that are pioneered or recaptured, if you will, from our human heritage, the long sweep of history of how human people have gotten together and function. And we've gotten away from it a lot in the last century. And I think Arthur sensed some of that. And I think this is what is trying to be recaptured or rediscovered in intentional communities that then becomes hopefully available to the widest possible audience. Not so that everyone will live that way, but will understand the power because everyone can build relationships where they are. It's not just about relationship to property ownership or land ownership, it's about relationship to people. So that's what I got to give. Thank you, Laird. I've got some questions I haven't typed, typed in yet, but we'll talk. Marianne, I'm gonna... My first, my first memory of Marianne is uh, wading in a stream with her one and a half year old son, something, something like that. Uh, but your formal bio, damn it. Marianne moved to Yellow Springs in 1972. It would have been in that summer that I saw her in a stream in Arkansas. Uh, she began working with Agraria, then Community Service Inc., shortly after and has been passionate about creating community ever since. She has served on numerous nonprofit boards and for many years coordinated the village mediation program. Uh, Marianne served as director of community service from 1998 to 2002. She went on to become a founder of Home Inc. 
I would say she's the, she's the first director who really got it going, uh, an organization dedicated to strengthening community and diversity in Yellow Springs in Miami Township through affordable and sustainable housing. She served as the director of Home Inc. until she retired in 2012. McQueen currently serves as the vice president of the Yellow Springs Council. Mary Ann, good morning or good afternoon. <laughs> Thank you, Don. And um, I'd also like to thank, well, you, Don, for your pres presentation, Emily and, and Laird. Uh, and what I would like to talk about really builds on uh, topics that all three of you discussed. I'm going to, I'm looking into the future. Well, I'm going to go back into the past, but I'm, I'm, my presentation is mostly into the future. So I want to talk about uh, sustainable Yellow Springs. And I think we could agree that Arthur Morgan's work was about what does it take for a small community to be sustainable? And uh, I've lived in Yellow Springs. Yellow Springs is the example that I'm going to give in this regard. I think that what we are currently facing some of the challenges that we're currently facing were not uh, understood and were not certainly in your face challenges when Morgan was alive. The one that we're very familiar with now is climate change, the impact of climate change and the uh, uncertainty of what that impact will be. The other is the collapse of our nat natural ecosystems globally. And that hasn't gotten quite the press that climate change has, but it is certainly of equal or more importance in terms of uh, as an existential threat to certainly to hu the human species as well as other species. Um, so uh, Rose, would you change the slide? I would like to first honor Faith Morgan and Pat Murphy, who've already been discussed some. They both contributed to foundational work in terms of looking at what are the kind of changes that we're going to need to make as communities uh, and globally if we're going to survive as a species. And so I appreciate the, the work that they have done. Now I wanna look back 100 years, 1921, uh, in uh, Industries for a Small Community, I think it is, Morgan talks about coming to Yellow Springs to take over Antioch College, also looking at what the village of Yellow Springs was at that time. So he describes the village as being a population of 1,300 people and as a farming community. Well, in a, the hundred years that have passed since then, things have changed a lot. Uh, Rose, would you change the slide, please? So uh, in the early 70s, I moved to Yellow Springs. This is a picture of me with my friends, um, a, a bunch of lesbians actually, <laughs> in, in the early 1970s. When I moved here, Antioch College seemed to be thriving. It was very easy to find a place to rent. Um, as a single mom, I could work part-time at community service, have my son in a cooperative daycare center, and live quite well. Uh, we had a rich cultural life. The population of Yellow Springs was over 4,000, and the uh, African-American population, part of the uh, community, was approximately 30%, I believe. Uh, Rose, would you change the slide? Here we are in approximately 2021. I, I'm at the bottom left. And uh, actually, a, a number of people who are uh, on this uh, call, or, or some people are in this picture, Susan Jennings. Uh, I think this was a workshop where uh, Michael Schumann had come to talk about local economy. I, I put these pictures in, uh, in part because people uh, in Yellow Springs anyway, 
bemoan how Yellow Springs has changed. Oh, it's not like it used to be. Well, none of, we aren't like we used to be either. You know, in 1971, I was uh, in my mid to late twenties and now I'm in my late seventies. So uh, as communities, you know, life changes. Antioch College is much smaller than it was uh, when I moved here. Housing has become extremely expensive in this community, in part because we have not continued to build more housing. Uh, that's not the only reason. The economy, uh, whereas when I moved here, we had Vernay, the Antioch Book Plate, YSI was a cooperative, the uh, owned business. Uh, the Vernay has not existed for uh, two decades. Uh, YSI is no longer uh, cooperatively owned. The book plate has gone out of business or has changed enough, it's not here. Uh, and our economy is highly uh, dependent on tourism, which has had a very big impact on the cultural life uh, in Yellow Springs. Uh, the population is uh, less diverse. Uh, we've become gentr we're gentrifying, we're older, uh, more wealth, uh, poverty, more uh, less middle class, just as happening in the country and in the world. Um, so this is the context in which I have been working to uh, start what we're calling the Yellow Springs Climate uh, or a Sustainable. <laughs> what is it called? Yeah, let's turn, turn, uh, would you turn the slide, please, Rose? Uh, okay, I'm getting ahead of myself. So I, I wanna speak just briefly about the history of work towards sustainability and climate uh, change response in Yellow Springs. Uh, we had a group of uh, volunteers who came together in, 19, er, in 2017 to create what we called the Yellow Springs Resilience Network. The distinction, between the use of the word resilience and sustainability generally is that sustainability was something that I know in the 90s when I was with community service uh, was the term we were using to uh, encapsulate what, what does it mean to be able to have, uh, in this case, a community that can sustain itself over time. The word resilience started coming into play more recently when it was realized that the impacts of climate change uh, meant that there's going to be instability and we're not necessarily going to know what we're going to be facing in the future. So we have to have that capacity to be resilient. And so both of those terms are important terms to be considering now as we think about the work that we need to do to be able to have a future. Uh, in 2018, the Environmental Commission, of which I am uh, the liaison, uh, worked on the beginnings of a climate action plan, and I've included a slide that shows the work that one of our members did in looking at what portion of greenhouse gas emissions come from what different sectors, and uh, the bottom right, uh, he is showing what he imagines uh, what he was able to determine would be the emissions in Yellow Springs. Neither of these two efforts uh, really moved the needle forward. And so in this year, 2021, I asked that one of the council goals be to develop a climate action and sustainability plan. And so we've started initiating a pilot project. And would you turn the slide, Rose? This is a picture of Cheryl Smith uh, standing beside Agraria. And I included this in part because Agraria is one of our uh, partners as we're working on the pilot project. Uh, I also included it because if you look on the left, you can see the, the five E words that our facilitator, a uh, young woman named Piper Fernway, came up with to, uh, so we can think about the principles that we're using as we're working on this plan. So equity, empowerment, education, economy, and evolution. And Cheryl, I concluded this with Cheryl because I had interviewed her about her uh, 
her interest in black farming and then her involvement with community solutions and agraria in sponsoring their first conference. Would you turn the slide, please? The picture, the photograph uh, is one that I took this, well, last month when I was visiting the island of Vinyl Haven, which is off the coast of uh, Rockland, Maine. And you can see three wind turbines there. And those wind turbines provide 60% of the electricity used on both Vinyl Haven, Haven and its neighboring island, North Haven. Uh, Yellow Spring, we don't have wind turbines here really much because we don't have that kind of wind. But uh, in Yellow Springs, we already get 85% of our electricity through renewable sources. And our climate action plan as we're working on it is looking at uh, how we can continue to increase locally our sources of renewable energy in terms of both residential community and potentially business solar. Uh, as probably anyone from Yellow Springs knows, we already have a solar array on Antioch campus and the village itself has one. And of course, another piece is also to continue to educate people on how to be more efficient in their use of uh, energy. Rose, would you turn the slide? Now, not everyone is gonna get a horse, but uh, as I was interviewing people in Yellow Springs who are already practicing some of the principles of how we are actually going to be more sustainable. I interviewed Sandy King, who did make a decision to sell her car and get a horse. Um, some of the things that Yellow Springs has already done is that we have a complete streets policy, which means that ideally any of our, the streets in Yellow Springs can be traveled both by uh, cars and trucks, but also by people on bicycles, walking, and other kinds of active transportation. And as you see, we have an active, transportation, <laughs> an active transportation plan and we've done safe walk, safe routes to schools. So part of the uh, climate action planning is to how do we increase walkability and bikeability? Another piece could be changing the all of the cars and vehicles that are owned by the village government by the schools, by Antioch College, by businesses into electric, electric powered vehicles. Uh, change the slide, please, Rose. Clearly, um, a lot of the impact of um, energy use comes from building both the embodied uh, energy in the buildings, as well as the energy that gets used through the life of the building. So this is the photograph of Andy and Beth Holyoke. Andy has built a number of straw bale house, houses in the, the village. And one aspect of straw bale is not only that it is very energy efficient in terms of heating and cooling of the building, but it also uses straw bales that are available locally. Some other things that uh, we're, we're working on is creating a new building department in the village, which potentially could impact uh, and encourage increased building efficiencies. And um, of course, working with uh, businesses, residents, the college, the schools on how to continue to increase efficiencies in our buildings. Uh, Rose, would you turn the slide? Most climate action plans uh, that are done by municipalities are done almost solely by the municipality. And they're almost solely focused on greenhouse gas emissions. As I mentioned, the uh, loss of native habitat, uh, species extinction, pollution, uh, overdevelopment by humans. All of that has uh, equal or perhaps more negative impact as, than the impact of climate change. And clearly, of course, they're related. So what I think Yellow Springs has made most progress on is the 
uh, domain of native habitat. And as one of the um, speakers at one of the uh, agraria conferences earlier this year, Doug Ptolemy had noticed, had noted that if residents, if we can save 30% of our habitat as native habitat, and in particular habitat where there are uh, not, not just isolated little spots, but habitat where animals and plants can, can move through corridors, we have a chance of maintaining life on earth somewhat as we know it. And so having a goal of whether it's your yard, uh, whether it's the school property, whether it's Antioch College, wherever, if we can have everyone ensure that they have at least 30% of native habitat, then we have a much better chance of surviving our species and others. Rose, would you change the slide, please? And this is a picture of Hope Taft. If you're from Ohio, you know she's the wife of former uh, Governor Bob Taft, who is, she's passionate about the Little Miami River. We're in the Little Miami River watershed and clearly how we treat our water, whether it's our drinking water, whether it's uh, our stormwater, whether it's our water that we go into our sewage system is critical on how we maintain our, our life. Uh, would you change the slide, Rose? And as has been mentioned, uh, local food is another aspect which generally is not included in climate action plans, but which we think is critically important. And these are some of the aspects that we're looking at in our um, climate action planning project. Would you change the slide, Rose? Okay, this is my last slide, I think. So this is a, a photograph of Dewart Headley and Kat, um, Christian, um, no, Cat Wal Walter, Walter. Um, you see their home, which is a passive home behind them. They have a natural habitat uh, for their yard. Uh, but I chose this slide because one of the things that they sponsored is what's called a repair cafe, where people can bring their uh, broken things and other people in Yellow Springs are there who have the expertise to repair them. And we've been stopped because of COVID over the last two years, but it's, I think, uh, a great example of what uh, Laird was discussing in terms of how our, by building our relationships, we can share what we have, whether it's repairing uh, something or, um, or actually, um, giving away something that we don't need anymore. So um, I, I, I'm sort of rushing through this and this is my last slide, but I just hoped that um, this would give you a taste of what I think, uh, sort of taking Morgan's ideas, but show, putting on top of that, what we're facing now in terms of um, how, how we will survive and using really the concepts, I think, of Arthur Morgan in order to do that. Thank you. And, and um, Rose, you can turn this off now. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Ann. Thank you all. Uh, I see a couple questions and comments in the uh, chat and please add. Uh, So we've, we've just, we've covered a broad sweep, of whether it's land ownership, community sustainability, and then the, the pioneering communities of intentional communities. Uh, and my concern for uh, looking at the, for the heart of, of culture being community. Uh, Laird, have you noticed sort of older intentional communities having gone through life stages that you see maybe not just one typical life cycle, but you see 
typical patterns in intentional communities over time? Um, it's, a, it's a big eclectic field, big tent. That is, communities come in many, many different shapes and sizes. Um, most of my, so there's, there's a significant um, division between those that have a, have a central leader, a charismatic leader that people kind of are attracted to the community to follow that person's guidance. And then there's another, which I'll call a secular groups, where, where, the, where the idea is that we'll decide collectively what to do. My attention has been more on the second part. Generally with the first group, they've been historically longer lived, more stable up to the lifetime of the founder. And then the transition to something that's vibrant afterwards through a new leader is usually pretty iffy. Um, okay, so that's that group in a very broad sweep. With the, um, the second group, there tends to be more clarity at the front end about what we're trying to do together. And then that tends to be diluted over time that where that is the new people coming in maybe don't have the same connection to the vision um, or that's not a, the, the integration of new people into that and to maintain vibrancy that was part of the founding or pioneering stage tends to be more difficult to maintain. So there tends to be a, um, a softening of the cohesion or the, or the connection or the how, how important that is over time. And so there's tends to be often a challenge of, uh, of a generational transition of like, okay, the original group of people ages out. And so even if they're successful in creating what they want and how do you bring in new people and revitalize it and how do you transfer the, uh, the, the, the power in some ways of the original group to the younger generation? And that's a trick. I mean, there's examples of it working, but, but it's a tricky thing and uh, not all groups successfully manage it. So it's not common to have some a community stay vibrant through more than a generation. It happens, but it's there's not a lot of examples. And it, that's if you survive the first generation going well. I mean, my my work is is basically with groups who are like it's not working like we thought. Help. And so that's where I I try to come in and say, well, this is what we've learned works in this situation, and it often means people being willing to. Uh, open up to each other in deeper ways than they thought they were committing to when they got in. And some are willing to do that. Not everybody is. That's a somewhat complicated answer. I see Joyce raising her hand. Joyce, do you want to unmute yourself? We're waiting. It's uh, typically a lower left of your screen and there's a little mic that says mute. If you tap that, you would be unmuted. Rose, uh, I don't have power to unmute you. Who's who's the, the host here? That... Somebody just unmuted me. <laughs> Finally. Okay. Um, I live in Silo community and I've lived here for, we have lived here for 49 years. Um, I do want to make one small correction. It was started in 1937. So next year it will be 85 years old. And I totally agree with everything that Laird Schwab has been saying about intentional communities. Um, we are really fortunate that um, we have a lot of young families who have moved um, are still moving into the community and some who have come back who grew up here and are now taking leadership roles in, in the community. Um, I always say to, um, to those who are looking at joining the community, you are not investing in real estate, you are investing in community because the way our, um, the way we are set up is that you, you will not, if you leave, you will not get the money back that you put into it. And so your investment is in community, not in real estate. And that is um, sometimes hard <laughs> for, for uh, people to understand. We now have about, I think, 58 households and about 125 people and a waiting list uh, because we only take two households a year in order to grow slowly. Um, but there have definitely been um, 
improvements, especially in the consensus decision-making process, um, which was not working very well at all when we moved here. But um, we, we have, you know, a health center, a wonderful, huge health center that serves the entire community and a food co-op that's been there since 1972, a craft that's totally cooperative, no paid person, a craft cooperative. And, um, but the, you know, taking care of each other, I think, and relationships is one of the most important parts of the community. And um, my husband and I, you know, he's 90 and I'm 85 and we certainly feel that support from the community. And, and also that our son, after wandering around all over the world for many years, when he got married and had a child, decided he, to move back here because he wanted to raise his children here. And this is happening because it's been really encouraging that uh, children who grew up here are moving back to raise their families here. So, you know, we're um, a vibrant community at this moment, but it's a lot of hard work. It's a lot of hard work to live in community. It's not utopia. And I don't know if, if you know about this book, Josh Lockyer has just published this book in June about CELO community seeing like a commons. And he started on this 20 years ago. And um, has, it's a very, very good book about the CELO community. Well, one of the reasons I asked about uh, generational change or life, life cycles in uh, intentional communities is that Laird mentioned STEL community uh, in Illinois, and I uh, rudely Googled it while he was talking. And without going into all the detail, it has morphed from intentional community uh, to a homeowners association and continuing uh, with local utilities and various local services. And They've got, they host a local nonprofit center for sustainable community. And it, in a lot of ways, it sounds like what Marianne is talking about Yellow Springs trying to do. Uh, and I don't know the home ownership pattern at Stell, but uh, Emily was describing uh, the land trust that Marianne and, and Emily have built. Uh, so it kind of, it connects all the presentations today. Uh, one of our questions on chat is more specific about, see the question is, what about the huge effect on climate and inclusion in the, in the plan decreasing beef and dairy cow input. So I guess I would respond to that. So uh, we, Yellow Springs is at the very early stage stages of planning. Uh, the, we started in August. So, so uh, we, ha we haven't uh, fleshed, fleshed out this plan. I think the first and biggest thing in terms of moving is moving toward local agriculture. Agriculture locally and regionally that meets local needs. Most of the farming in our area, in Green County, surrounding counties is, uh, I'll call it industrialized agriculture. If you drive out in the country, you see corn and soybeans. That, that's well, Susan knows more about this than I, I think. 90%, I, I expect, of that agriculture is industrialized agriculture. So how do you move from, start moving from that to creating a diverse agricultural base that, that works locally and regionally? I, I think those are the things that need to happen before we 
or, or as we start looking at how we decrease uh, our raising of animals for food. Well, another question. Uh, how do you think the shutdowns related to COVID have changed the landscape of our community? This is in, it's actually addressed to Marianne and Emily. Well, I'll start. Um, I and this is something I was going to. Uh, I didn't say when I was talking. I think that one of the changes in Yellow Springs, but clearly it's not Yellow Springs, is in regard to what Laird was talking about. How do you deal in a community where you have differing points of view? Now, I would say fifty years ago. You know, I'm not sure how good we were at doing it in our community, but you know, I think we did pretty good. And uh, up through, I I had our I coordinate our mediation program in the '90s, and we were able to people were able to come together frequently and talk about differing opinions. That is not true today, and uh, in part it's because of social media. I think. Uh, there are a lot of forces, but I think the pandemic has impacted us in that way. And even here we are on Zoom. It's great to do this because we can, Laird can be here from Duluth and Lee is probably somewhere <laughs> up in that same sort of area. But there is something missing when you cannot meet together with you people to people. And I think that it does contribute to a lesser ability to work through conflicts and issues. Emily, did you have any comment on how has COVID impacted the community? Yeah, um, I, I posted a response in the chat, which I'll read and elaborate on. <laughs> okay. So uh, great question, Susan. Um, in the short term, I think that we all felt the presence of a strong community. Um, community, there were, you know, like 70 or so community leaders that jumped into action. Grids were created to account for every single person in the village. Uh, we had neighborhood contacts who were literally going door to door. Um, emergency food being provided. Uh, you know, I mean, there was just a ton of resilience, I would say, that was exhibited during this time. And I felt very appreciative of living here um, as we embraced technology. And um, so though we were isolated and there is definitely an othering that happened, I think globally, even as we maybe felt like we were becoming more empathetic, um, there was also just a great loss of empathy and, and othering, especially for, for those with differing opinions. So um, I kind of feel like we're in a healing time right now and that getting together in forums such as this and in person is essential to our uh, healing and to looking to the future. Um, I'm pretty confident that carbon emissions were reduced here as they were in other places <laughs> during um, the pandemic, even in a small town, uh, because I just, you all you had to do was walk around and probably, you know, twofold, this is anecdotal, but I would say twice as many people were in their gardens on any given day uh, than in the non-pandemic year. So I think a lot of people were slowing down and spending time with their neighbors and uh, in their own backyards. And I hope that continues. Um, but also I think it revealed some of the underlying economic inequality in our country and world, um, also in our community. Um, economic inequality, and then of course it's twin racial inequality with um, the Black Lives Matter movement and George Floyd protests that locally there was uh, a lot of activity and energy around that, um, especially with our young people. Um, but you know, for the first time during the pandemic, the enterprise uh, community uh, partners puts out a dashboard report. And for the first time ever, now more than half of the people renting in Yellow Springs paid too much for their rent so that they feel it in other areas 
of their life and have to make difficult decisions between necessities to make ends meet. So what we call housing cost burdened. Um, and that trend I think is just gonna continue. And so uh, my hope is that we remember some of the persistent systemic inequality that was made visible during the pandemic and do more as a community to address it. Um, and I will just end by saying, I really love the goal of 30% native habitat in our yards and common areas. Marianne, I feel like that's, I feel like if we put that challenge out to everyone who lives in Yellow Springs, they would probably step up and we'd exceed that goal just in our own backyards. Um, Barb, Karen, you said you were, you had a few things to say about CeeLo. Can we unmute Barb? Rose, can you unmute Barb? We don't hear you yet, Barb. Here I am, okay. Now well, we got um, <laughs> I've uh, lived in Silo community since 1951. Um, I moved here with my parents. Most of you might know Bob and Dot Barris rather than you know the name Perrin because that's my husband. But anyway, um, I was the first uh, child of, of, uh, to come back. Um, and that was after checking out the world and deciding that this was maybe a better place to live than a lot of, uh, uh, went to college, uh, Olney Friends School, Earlham College. Then I moved to the city, Boston, and, uh, and then back again. So <laughs> um, anyway, um, when I, I waited to join, actually join until I um, was ready to, get married and have a family. I figured if I was gonna meet somebody, I might move elsewhere. Okay, so enough about me. Um, I, uh, I feel, unlike Joyce, that, that it's a, a big shift time in the community because um, so many people are moving away and dying and uh, you know the new people coming in maybe can't afford the houses that other people bought, you know, I think, uh, than other people have built over the years. Um, I'm hopeful for all the new people, but um, I I feel like <laughs> the process has been slowing down too much, that some of the vibrant young people that come here are turned away because of the long wait list. And uh, there's got to be a balance. Um, the other thing is that there's a really core of people that run things rather than everybody having a say about things. And uh, uh, the diversity is way down. <laughs> I think there's, we need to encourage more diversity. Boy, I'm, I don't usually talk and I'm going nuts. So anyway, um, there's a lot of things that we're looking at in CeeLo. Um, my parents, especially my mother, always said, you don't move here if you plan to leave. Well, everybody leaves sometimes. My dad was 98 and she was 93 and they left, you know. I mean, <laughs> um, community sustained them. My dad was a CEO. A lot of people that started the community were CEOs. Um, there was like, uh, what am I? See, I'm the oldest member. <laughs> and it's sort of funny because you just take it for granted when you, when you live here, you know, it's like all the values and stuff. And you go somewhere else and you go, oh, other people don't really know about this or understand this, do they? So I'm going to quit now. I, could... <laughs> I see a lot of people here. I see that there's only 20 participants. So it's like, feels okay to talk. Barb, yes. What you you just said when you you go somewhere else and a lot of people don't realize what you've experienced, kind of an a repeat of some of what I was trying to say that there is a we people who have stayed in one place and have. Uh, 
a six generation, five generation frame of reference, it, it just looks different. Uh, it, it doesn't mean that you're right and other people are wrong, but there's a different resonance to social behavior. Uh, and do I see any hands waving? Greta from CELO. Hello. Um, just an addition and an increased perspective on CELO. We are a family that in our experience living here for over 45 years, has seen that five to six generations. But last night was an event that highlights the community building possibility of an intentional community. It was a burning man type burning to highlight the end of COVID fear. And the CELO community was less than half of the participants. We have gathered 10 or 15. Oh, what? 10 or 50. There's been gathered in this intentional formal community, an unintentional community of people who work together, play together, create entertainment together, buy each other's farm products, help each other's lives. So community isn't just this 85 year old in, uh, intentional community that we were gifted. It is the greater community that grows around us. Now our challenge is becoming more diverse. Any other reflections, questions? I can add a piece, Don. Um, I want to give an example of, of how intentional communities can be an inspirational model for doing things differently. Um, I'd lived for a, a few years, many years as a neighbor, but a few years in a, a, an echo village called Dancing Rabbit in Rutledge, Missouri. And they've tried to make a statement of like, well, what can we do to create a quality of life that minimizes resource acquisition and consumption? And so among other things, they do a thing that's very profound relative to US society today. They said, well, you, if you live here, in a, and this is in rural Missouri where there's really no public transportation, you can't run a private car. We will provide a car co-op, which you can choose to be a member of so you have access to vehicles, but it has to be in that context. That's the only thing we're gonna to allow to see what we can do with that as to create a model. So the, the wider perspective is that in the United States today, the ratio of licensed vehicles to licensed drivers, you may or may not know, is about six to five. Now, if you digest what that means for a second, it means that if everybody who is a licensed driver was in a vehicle all by themselves at the same time, which would never happen, but if that did happen, there would still be 20% of the vehicle fleet ready to drive that couldn't be used because all the drivers were somewhere else. And think about what that represents in terms of investment of resources, in terms of not just buying a vehicle, but insurance, parking, et cetera. That it is, I'm talking about fat in the system, all right, in terms of that. Now, Dancing Rabbit said not only, and this is, this is like going to the extreme around the point I was making earlier around owning something instead of sharing something. Well, they were gonna experiment with sharing on vehicles in Dancing Rabbit and through the car co-op they did. And so they have a system, which is somewhat clever, where if you want to use a vehicle and you're part of the co-op, at any given time you put in a request and they try to figure out how to manage their fleet of vehicles so that you can go where you want the day you want to go. They've got a system that can provide that more than 95% of the time for the people. You can go to the town you want to in a vehicle on the day you want. Now, you may have to share that ride with other people, so you may have to go early or stay late, but you can go where you want on the day you want to go. How many vehicles do you think 50 people need to accomplish that level of meeting the needs? Just pause for a second. Drum roll. The answer is four, not five, and one of them's a pickup 
which hardly ever gets used. Now think about that first statistic I gave you, six to five, and they're doing one to 10 or one to 12, something like that. And so they're demonstrating that they can take the, the cars they need to actually meet their needs is less than 10% of the US average is what's out there. Now think about what that represents in terms of the ability to get off the treadmill in terms of as an economic model and, and resource consciousness about let's think intelligently about we need what we actually need to meet our needs. Now, now I'm gonna add one more little cherry on top of that. The number one type, type of vehicle today, number one selling type of vehicle in the US is a pickup truck. Now pickups have an important use in some situations, but nowhere near to justify being the number one selling kind of vehicle in the country. This is, this is a fashion statement, an expensive, not efficient vehicle so that you can look cool. Because you, because you pay, I mean, it's like, <laughs> and you can't tell me we don't have a lot of work we can do to reduce resource consumption. And intentional communities are trying to lead the way in showing how that might be done. That's my piece. I love that. I, uh, I just bought a used pickup truck that used to belong to Community Solution. Mary Ann? Yeah, I wanted to piggyback on what Laird was talking about because the idea of sharing resources, well, one, it builds relationships. It's cheaper, but it also means that we're using much less materials, much less uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So it, it's such a, it cuts across so many uh, different areas. And I think, Figuring out how to do that uh, in the broader community is, is, is critical, especially for bigger things like vehicles. And I've just started reading a book by, is it Richard Heinberg he Pow called Power? Richard Heinberg? Richard Heinberg, yeah. And I think the central thesis of his book is that human, uh, we're, we're, pro we're, likely leading to our demise by our ability to access and use so much power. And how, how, can we, how can we ratchet down our desire to always be able to control things and sharing uh, resources and equipment uh, and buildings, uh, I think is part of that. No, uh, many of us, got engaged in thinking about community, uh, joining new communities in the early 70s. And I thought, you know, that the global collapse was soon. Well, 50 years have passed and I kind of think the global collapse is soon. Well, I hope I'm wrong. Well, maybe I don't hope I'm wrong. Uh, but uh, I imagine jumping back, uh, you know, I think Arthur Morgan was looking, during the time he was in Dayton, working on the uh, Miami Conservancy District that people will hear more about this afternoon. Uh, I think he had premonition that the civilization that he was thriving in was vulnerable and rocking and it might collapse. And of course the recession, uh, the depression came and, uh, and he was asking a lot of the same questions. How do we take the best and save it? How do we pass things on? Uh, what's the, if things do this current system falls apart, what's the bedrock that we can build from something new? Not, we may not be me, but people who I hope will be carrying on. Well, maybe there hasn't been a collapse, but we've been telling stories of trying to do what he's talking about, or what I think he was talking about. 